multi-gaming stream. I'm Peter Swidler and with me today is Patrick Leonard who is a, a party poker ambassador and also uh, something that is sort of closer to my heart. Uh, somebody who does uh, who does work for Run It Once, uh, a site that is very, very, very dear to my heart. So establishing biases here. Uh, and we'll be doing, uh, it's it's billed as a coaching session, but I don't know if that's exactly what, what, what shall be happening. We'll be looking at the two games we'll be playing in a couple of days' time against another very illustrious pair and sort of trying to plug as, ma as many leaks as we can in, in the very, very limited time available. Uh, hi, Patrick. Was that, uh, was that a fair introduction? Hey, yeah, good to be here. You also didn't mention that I'm a very, very poor chess player, so uh, I think I, that's I, it. I was, I was, yeah. That's an important play. caveat to tell the audience to not expect anywhere near expert chess from me. Uh, uh, you, you, you keep on telling me that, but on, on the evidence I've seen so far, we, we did, uh, I, I reached out to Patrick a few days ago and we've, uh, we've not done any extensive work or anything, but on the evidence I was presented, I I think you're trying to kind of lower the expectations a little bit there to to then to, you know shock everybody by but yeah, yeah let's just yeah. drop this line this line of questioning altogether uh so what uh, what the structure of the the event we will be playing in uh looks like as we understand it is uh, we're playing three sets of uh hand and brain uh chess where I will be the brain and you will be making the moves over the board I think at the same time as heads up uh, sit and goes uh, which should provide for, you know, hilarity should ensue at some point, <laughs> I assume. Uh, but uh, at first, let's uh, let's talk about the chess part a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, once again, in the time frame available, we should probably sort of try to establish uh, what you like to do uh, in the opening with the white pieces, with the black pieces, so, so that I don't kind of corral you into things you don't particularly want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. uh, in terms of general strategy, I think it's very difficult to establish sort of general strategy for only three games to play. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's perhaps you know if if we can have the board uh, the board up, we could maybe uh, start looking at some chess. What's uh, what's your sort of general background in chess? So actually, quite interestingly, I played chess almost every day as a say six year old till like. 14 year old with my parents mm. but there was like a general rule between my parents and I that we would never try to study outside of the house or like on the internet it was basically just like trying to exploit each other in like a fun way so I would try to find their weaknesses and I would just like play a very heavy like exploitative strategy rather than like theoretically correct strategy so like my dad would be moving like pawns to like uh you know h6 or whatever and like starting off really poor openings and i would just be trying to exploit it so we weren't the standard the, le the the level of standard was very poor between us i was very bad and they were slightly worse than me perhaps um so i used to win most matches against my parents so i used to think i was really good and then when i got to like i guess 18 i went to university and made like a, a chess profile wherever i made it and I started playing and I was just awful. And I, I had these expectations that I was going to be this, you know, Magnus Carlsen, like chess master. But in reality, I was really bad. So I was put off from chess because I was a lot worse than I expected myself to be. Uh, because I was so I was so enthusiastic about chess as a, you know, as an infant, let's say. Um, so then yeah, I that's, just think, a, that's not a very pleasant feeling when you when you yeah. expect your level to be to be a and it isn't instead instead a, a value of B which is completely different uh, yeah. so uh, now that we uh, we have the board up so uh, since the board seems to be aligned the way it's aligned what what are your openings with the black pieces like what do you what do you do against the uh, the e4 uh, players what do you do against the d4 players? So typically, um, I, I mean, I'll just show what happens here. But yeah. I usually, I usually go for. Um, you, you have to make the, the white move first, yeah. So, so. so usually they are going for e4 in mm -hmm. the games I play, and then I move to. Uh, but you can e4. you can take that book. You you can take that move back and play, play yeah, so, e4 on the yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically, the the way that the games I play it, the low the low standards the low level games mm -hmm. is it goes like this. I go here. They usually bring um, knight here to f3. Mm -hmm. And then typically 
I used to make like a fishy move, I guess, before I used to move to here and then they used to capture me and I realized that was bad. So now I started to go, uh, yeah. uh, I, st uh, uh. I started to move here. Oh, sorry. I started to move. Um, oh, I can't go back. I started to move to here instead mm -hmm. to, to, to try to protect this pawn. Then they do a bunch of different kind of moves. So they can, they will sometimes do this. And then if I take here, they take here and then they're protected by the Queens. So this is, this is quite a common first few moves, I would say, in the games I play. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to stop you there because, like, like the, the the opening three is uh, the, the opening tree is quite large, and we don't need to go through all of it. And uh, I don't know if you noticed me kind of uh, barely containing uh, laughter at some point. Yeah, yeah, it was it was because yeah. you you described the perfectly legitimate second move from Black as obviously very bad and as something you are no longer playing. Oh, okay. And, okay. and uh, it, it it sounded like sort of. But also it's a move which many people think is kind of boring and shouldn't be played for entertainment reasons. So okay. it sounded like you were like you were firing shots at uh, at you know at the boring chess, and instead you are trying to play more exciting chess. So it, yeah. it seemed it seemed like a like a, a, a you know a weird weird inside inside joke, which is probably only funny to me. But <laughs> when you when you said that you used to play knight f six here, but you are no longer playing knight f six because the move is bad, that was. Oh, uh, I maybe not bad, but I I didn't have good success with it. Let's say yeah, you know? th that is actually fair. Yeah, I've, I've had openings like this myself in my career where uh, they are objectively fine, and I was also even getting normal positions out of uh, out of those openings, but it just didn't suit me. And you yeah. you, you then have to start playing something else. So, but in terms of what we're expecting tomorrow, it was just important for me to to know that. Uh, you're playing uh, the, 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 the E5 and IT6 types of setups because I think then uh, we can uh, we can navigate that. I can uh, I can be sort of better prepared for uh, for what is happening there. And uh, if they if they open with the with the deep one on move one, what can um, we expect there? If they more if they move to here, yeah that that, that guy to yeah. D here, then here this doesn't happen as much actually in game. This is um, I moved here. Mm -hmm. um and then it went like this and i went like this so it's kind of the the same the inverse yeah the, the opposite side yeah. and then from here they usually bring out their second knight and then i go here yeah that uh, already that already is maybe not not as required but once again i i don't think you know the the intention today uh should be for me to try and teach you like all of the opening theory because i don't think we uh, we have time for that. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps you know, talking about sort of general principles more from from uh, the game I've seen you play uh, before the stream, it seems like you have a a, a pretty decent uh, sort of general understanding of what to aim for, and uh, th that was that was very uh, very nice to see. But what we should be trying to do uh, when. Uh, uh, you know, game day actually rolls on. We mm -hmm. should be trying to sort of, uh, you know, not go down particular tactical rabbit holes in the openings. I guess we should be trying to kind of develop, uh, develop naturally. Make sure that you know the king is the king is safe. The king probably should get castled as soon as possible so that we don't get stuck in any kind of situations with the king in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And. Uh, uh, the the difficult part would be sort of when when the, the game reaches the middle game the difficult part will be to to kind of calibrate uh calibrate you know what to aim for like uh that's alarming <laughs> uh so in 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 a more sort of general sense uh if let's say uh, a, a chess game uh, a chess game develops and you know you got to move fifteen uh, with a you know the material balance still still intact you know you, you don't have extra material you haven't you haven't given away any material pieces are sort of roughly developed normally uh, what's your like if if you're playing if you're playing on your own are you playing for like attacks against the king or are you playing to uh, to trade pieces and play end games, what appeals to you more? So my my gen my first logic is just going. I first of all tried to capture the center of the board, and then I tried to castle ASAP. Once I've tried to capture the center of the board, I try to, uh, I guess, exploitatively against these weaker opponents. I tried to uh, like make a 
uh, I tried to capture on, on a blunder essentially. And then once I capture on a blunder, I then start to try to trade pieces a bit. And then my typical kind of uh, attack is I try to try to get my, uh, my knights in around here and around here, trying to get into a way where I can uh, get in, get the king into check and then take the castle essentially like this kind of looking for a kind of mistake mm -hmm. from my I opponent. understand, yeah. Uh, but that, I guess we're not going to see that from the guys, but that's yeah. how I'm approaching it right now. Yeah, probably uh, probably that would would need to be toned down a little bit against uh, against Ike and Sasha because we we suspect they will not be as prone to to giving stuff away for free. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is sort of unfair because I'm supposed to be doing the coaching, but like from from your side, is there is there something that you you, you think needs to be addressed? Uh, in, in, in this conversation, because like we, we could go through uh, through opening moves. I could definitely like give you an overview of uh, uh, openings we could expect. We could like see what your responses are. That definitely you know is something is something we could spend the next half an hour on. But is yeah. there something is there something that you feel like needs to be discussed, addressed? Uh, yeah, I think I think a big mistake I've seen for myself, or it feels like a mistake, is I I get my queen out a bit too early. So. Basically, yeah, see, that that is something we can definitely mitigate by me never saying the word queen until move. Right? <laughs> so, like, yeah, <laughs> that's uh that should not be uh, that should not be difficult to uh, uh to adjust for. Uh, and yeah. yeah, that is that is a common mistake that you probably need to be uh, need to be avoiding. Yeah, and I, I'd say a big mistake I make is I maybe get a little bit too impatient too early. Like maybe I just start attack. I'm very aggressive. Like. In any kind of game I play, I probably go a little bit too aggressive. Maybe I like trade pieces off too early or something like that. Maybe I just show this game was played at like 8:30 a.m. after studying poker for 12 hours last night. So I probably I wasn't in the best frame of mind for playing, but we're probably gonna see like some of my uh logic here being flawed. So I can maybe just show what I would do next. Because I think I think my first initial openings, like my first three to five moves, are usually like okay. And then maybe like my move 10 to 15 are quite poor. So maybe we can get to like the slightly Yeah, I mean, this ahead. position is extremely unlikely. I, I think this position probably never, never happens. Uh, today, yeah, so maybe so. we can, maybe we can kind of. Uh, yeah, you can use the, you can use the arrows be, be, be below the board. Yeah, the, the, the arrows work. So we can, let's say, let's imagine that they just go with this open. So I currently play Yeah, this, this. is fine. Yeah, this is fine. Uh, this already is a quite a rare move, uh, I have so, to say. It's not that it doesn't exist. So they normally either play uh, the the C pawn to C four, or the other knight uh, comes out. So uh, the, the the two main moves here are this one and and C four. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is this. I would probably um, keeping the symmetry here is completely fine. Yeah. I would usually have done this. I think. Yeah. That is that game. is that is uh, absolutely fine. And, because and, yeah. Um, and then I would imagine that they usually play. They wouldn't do this. No, maybe. that that loses a pawn. Yeah, yeah. Th maybe do that, this. Uh, here once again, uh, like the two, this. the two absolutely like ideologically, there are two things that white players do in this position. One is the move c two c four with the pawn. Uh, yeah, that pawn uh, two two squares forward, which uh, you know looks like uh, it's called a gambit because it looks like the pawn is it, it can be taken. It can indeed be taken, but if you if you do pick it up, uh, White uh, will uh, win it back quite comfortably. And uh, so, like if if you see this for the first time, what's your what's your normal reaction here as Black? My goal, my goal, it could be flawed, but I'm always trying to try to control these like four. For no, that is that is not flawed at all. That is that is absolutely um, correct. That is. I, I would never move my as long as it's protected. I would never move my pawn to take because uh, I feel like this pawn is a weaker pawn than my pawn in terms of position of being like slightly on the flanks rather than central. So I would rather, for example, make a move either like this or like or like this potentially. Well, um, yeah, both of those two moves are arguably in the in the top three in the top three like. I think statistically there are three moves in this position that people make. One is actually taking the pawn. There's nothing particularly wrong with taking it. It's just that you have to be uh, prepared that you're not winning it. You're just borrowing it, so to speak. Yeah. And and then the two moves that you mentioned, one is c6 and one is e6, and both of them are completely fine. Uh, I think 
once again, your um, sort of understanding of what to fight for in the opening, even if you don't know any actual opening theory uh, outside of some corners where you've had games, still, it seems like your instincts are very much on point. Uh, because I, is, so, would you so, say this is flawed? I, I would have went for this pawn instead of this pawn in terms of ranking, because I feel like uh, being able to potentially get this pawn centrally is is a better play for me than being able to. I I, I don't think I don't here. think you can you can actually. Uh, uh, I mean, both are perfectly solid. Both I think as things stand right now in let's say uh, grandmaster practice, both are supposed to give you uh, give you equality or close to equality if you play if you play well afterwards. So it's it's hard to uh, you know definitively say that this is stronger than the other one. Both of them are completely fine. Uh, it's it's slightly. I think if there is a reason to prefer this one to uh, to the move e six is that your light squared bishop, yeah, is not being locked down by your own pawn. So you can in some cases develop it before playing the the other pawn to e six. So that okay. gives you uh, you, you know it gives you slightly more flexibility. It gives you. Uh, it gives you more more options later in the game, but mm -hmm. very often you will end up playing e6 anyway later. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, if those are your first two instincts, both are fine, and uh, it, and you, you keep on you keep on saying uh, probably this reasoning is flawed. This reasoning is completely fine. Like if if that's what you've. Uh, uh, incorporated from your from your childhood uh, games like the idea of fighting tooth and nail for the center that's probably the best thing you could have gotten out of your childhood spent mm -hmm. playing chess i think this is like the healthiest thing uh, if you had to choose one thing it's probably between this and the idea that you need to develop pieces quickly and like get the king get get the king to safety those two concepts are arguably the two most important concepts for uh for uh, starting players because uh, that that you know gives you healthy positions out of the opening and having healthy positions out of the opening is obviously tremendously important something which i i would never i never used to make this move because i always want to get my knight out as soon as possible against weaker players so I would always avoid, I would basically never play c6 ever as a move. If I ever move my pawn, this pawn in any in any kind of opening, I'd always only move it to c5 because yeah. I wanted to get my bishop out, but this kind of blocks it, right? If I go here, then... Yeah, it does. But uh, it's it's interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, we don't need to, or we don't need to look through much of that game that we have open, like the the original one uh, that we opened to have the analysis board. But you did play knight c6 in that game with the mm -hmm. pawn still on c7. So let me see uh, what I yeah. did. I went here. You can, you can just click on the click on the notation and that gives you like any position. So the notation to the right uh, of the board. If you go to like your third move with black knight c6, knight c6. It, just, it just shows you this yeah. position. And I wanted to say that you know, if, if you want to criticize your opening choices in that game, I wanted to say sort of exactly what you said just now, which is kind of curious because you you just, once again, you stated something I agree with wholeheartedly, but you made this move in the game, which is, yeah, kind, yeah, of, yeah. Which is kind of confusing. I think in general, you do want to have the option of playing uh, c5 before you develop the knight to the square. Putting mm -hmm. this knight in front of the c pawn makes your future play sort of more dif more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a kind of a well, interesting disparity between uh, uh, between what you said, which I uh, once again completely agreed with, and what you've and what you've demonstrated in the game, which is yeah, yeah. Uh, knight sure. six is not is not a particularly uh, uh, great move here. It's not it's not like a any kind of a decisive mistake or anything, but uh, yeah. it's it's not it's not the best move in the position for for sure. Yeah, there's yeah, not much like, I can really get going now with that. Yeah, yeah, it's it 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 just kind of hampers your own play. It it makes it more difficult for you to challenge the the white setup. If if you if if we take this move back, uh, just uh, yeah, and we just, let's say we go e6 here, or maybe even the immediate c5. But in particular, if we go e6 first and then c5, like e6, white does something. I don't know, uh, bishop. Let's say the dark square bishop comes out somewhere. I don't know, f4 or somewhere, and we can play c5 here. Uh, and after we've played c5, no, we, we, yeah, we move c5 first. 
And after we've played c5, we can definitely uh, consider going knight c6 next, because the knight is no longer uh, stopping us from achieving this type of play in the center. So that's kind of healthy, and that's more of a setup we should be aiming for in these types of positions. But we wouldn't see this opening probably from... Probably Pittsburgh, not, right? yeah, probably yeah. not. I don't think... Well, once again, we have nothing to go uh, to go on, and... Uh, so we imagine... Know. We imagine we would see this, and then we imagine we would play this, yeah. and then what or, did we? See? Or what I think is probably likelier, although I don't know what I'm basing this on. I think it's likely they just go one e four and move one. I think uh, a lot more players, at, yeah, even earlier, yeah, not not here, even like like in a, in a very starting position. I, yeah. For some reason, it feels to me that you know uh, Ike is uh, Ike is likelier to play. Uh, to play uh, e4 rather than uh, rather than d4. I, I have I have absolutely nothing to base that on. It's just mm -hmm. a, like a gut feeling. Uh, and we can maybe discuss this for a little bit. So knight c6 is completely fine. The move you are making now instead of the the Petrov. Uh, yeah, that that one. So yeah. I, I would I would I would move here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, here. Uh, yeah, once again, uh, d depending on whether you know they they do any prep work at all. Uh, what most people seem to do here, I would assume, is is bishop to b5. I think that's probably, even mm -hmm. at the somewhat beginner level, yeah, it's either here or one one square further. Uh, Usually, I mean, obviously, this is just against people I play against. Oh, I've almost never seen this move ever. They always go here. Mm, okay. they, yeah, that's, they, that's actually interesting to me because I, I would have thought that, uh, you know, bishop b5, statistically, I'm pretty sure, is the... Uh, the, the the most played move uh, if you if you like check the large databases which contain like the sum of it's not the sum of human knowledge but it is the sum of human practice I'm pretty sure Bishop B5 is a much more uh, much more well, maybe not much but it's more commonly played move than Bishop C4 but if if your sample says that Bishop C4 is likelier then maybe this is what we should be going for and what's your normal reply here uh, well now now I'm quite troubled because I don't have Usually, like if it'd been set up slightly different, I would then move my pawn to e6 to stop this whole castle mm -hmm. thing going on here. But because I can't do that, I often feel myself quite troubled at this point. Like this is where I, this is where I know there's a big weakness. Where now I feel like I can't really, I can't really do much because if I go pawn here, I'm in a bad. That state. That just loses a pawn, yeah. If Let I me, go I, here, I'm in a bad state. Yeah. I think I think yeah. maybe you know if if we have stumbled upon something which is uncomfortable maybe for you, here. we could actually just discuss this position. Uh, you, you you can if you want to avoid yeah. Let's not touch. Uh, let's not touch the f pawn. Uh, it's it's very rarely a good idea to move the f pawn early in the opening. There are you know memes on this topic, but we we don't we don't need to get into the very very specialized subject of chess memes. But if we want I would to have stop... went here in game. This is what I would have done. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just this is what mm, I would have done. Yeah, but to stop I, this. With the, because we like because you are worried about this idea of the knight landing on that square. I just want to show you a way to kind of defang that and not have to worry about it very much. So after bishop c4, if we if we take this back for a second, yeah. we can make a symmetrical move with the bishop. We can move the bishop to c5, our own dark square bishop. Uh, as you can see, for now the, the square g5 is covered by our, by our queen, right? We, uh, if they go knight g5 here, we can just take the knight. Nothing stops us from taking the knight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for now this is not a threat, but they can play something like d2, d3 here, for instance. And that does establish the threat of knight g5 next move. Yeah, that move, yeah. To no, hit. one square. D4, D4 is a gambit. D4 exists as a move, but once yeah. again, I think for them to play D4 in this position, they would need to actually like spend a couple of hours, uh, first of all, scouting and then preparing. And I think, you know, knowing what we know about uh, about Ike and Sasha in particular, I think scouting and then preparing for hours is not very likely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have to worry about it that much. Uh, and now we can develop our kingside knight to F6. Uh, and uh, sorry, and say again. Just develop develop the second knight to uh, okay. uh, to them. Yeah, and and what we've done by doing this by developing the bishop first is that we are allowing knight g five. But if they play knight g five, we can now castle, and castling protects mm. the pawn on f seven very comfortably. We are not we're not really worried about this at all. That's very nice. Okay, uh, I like so I like that. so that that actually like it's it's just like this is maybe one of the. Uh, 
I don't know, three most topical positions in top level chess right now. We are not going to be able to cover it in any kind of detail, even if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. But just to just to deal with the surface level of being worried about the threat to your F7 pawn. If, if, if that's what our major worry is, this is how you deal with it. You okay. develop the bishop first, uh, making sure that knight g5 is not possible yet because we can take it. And then we develop the knight. Uh, I mean, your move, your move h6 is, I mean, it's fine on, on some level, but it doesn't really do what you yourself stated is your normal aim in the opening, which is fight for the center. Mm -hmm. You're basically making a like a entirely defensive move here, trying yeah. to trying to stop perceived threats, not even real threats right this moment. They are perceived future threats. And we are giving up to a large degree the fight for the center. So yeah. it, it will probably get punished against good opposition if you play h6 here. H6 is not not a very why I didn't play bishop. Move. Why I didn't play bishop mm -hmm. is why I didn't play the bishop is because I think I I'm probably thinking like a few moves behind that you are, you know, maybe I'm thinking three or four moves and you're thinking, you know, a bit more. So I would normally think if I play bishop, they're gonna go here. Uh I yeah, take we, we can we can take, yeah. They take well, we uh, this this then, actually loses yeah, us. This, well, then they can, yeah. They, well, they wouldn't take me here, right? Because I have, I would take their queen. So this yeah, is actually so not a bad position for me, I guess. This is a very good position for you, yeah. Uh, and then, I, then usually in game, what I would do is they would do something like this, and then I usually go here, and then. Well, they, I mean, not not leaving the bishop on prees uh, is like moving moving the bishop away is also not a mistake. It is hanging, so why why can't we just move it move it away from? Because if they take me, I, yeah. Again, I'm just saying like how, I, how yeah, I'm okay. thinking. I would then check him, and then he would have to. I guess he moves here, something like this. Yeah, this is a move you can you can also interpose with uh, either of the bishops. This is not going to be a legal move because your queen. Oh, is being, then my yeah. queen. Okay, so that's that's where the flaw is in that kind of logic. Then that's where that. But that's also, where it stops also, you know, it it's uh, it we we do come back to that that thing you said about you being a very aggressive player because uh, if if we go through that sequence, like if you uh, if you show you, you can in the notation you can click on four d four again, yeah, or or do it manually, yeah. Yeah. If they actually for some reason give you this piece, just like. Once again, not expecting this to happen tomorrow. Yeah. But if if this if this entire sequence happens tomorrow, uh, after after they attack your bishop, you probably should like. There is no reason for you to even try to calculate any kind of force variations. You are at that point up a whole piece for nothing. Mm -hmm. So just move it back and play normally. Your position is strictly speaking completely winning already. Okay. So, like, there is no particular reason for you to try and make it tactical and and forcing because your your opponent has committed enough of a mistake to to cost him the game normally if you just don't blunder anything back. Okay. So, so would you expect to see castle here from him? Yeah, or? castles is castles is a very normal move. Uh, D yeah. three is a very normal move. C three is a very normal move. Uh, in in many many cases they actually kind of all flow into the same position like by move six there is a position here let's say they castle we develop the knight uh, yeah. to f6 uh, as yeah. usual they play d3 because they pretty much always play d3 anyway we can play either castles or d6 here for instance let's make it simple yeah whichever way you prefer. I would, I would normally castle yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 they play let's say c3 here uh, uh. C3. And we play, and we play. I don't know, d six. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have. Ex I I wouldn't have expected that. Just I I don't know that that move. Mm. So that's interesting. So then I would play d six. Yeah, d six. And and this position can be arrived at in like five different ways because both our moves and their moves can be basically interposed. Okay. Because so we're not really interacting with each other. We're both developing our pieces. So uh, the last three moves for us, and the last three moves for them can be made in, in almost any order leading to this position. And then, you know, this is a very complicated position. We can talk about uh, about plans here. But once again, we, we have no real expectation. This is what we will see. So I don't think yeah. going down that particular rabbit hole is uh, is very useful. Yeah, OK. I mean, at this point, I would always be like quite flustered. Like I feel I feel from my, you know, again, I, I, I say it a lot because I, I do think it's true from my very uh, flawed logic 
once I get to this point, if I don't really see a plan of attack, because mm -hmm. I, I like to be aggressive, I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm like, I get flustered. I'm like, okay, like I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't have like a, a clear plan of how I'm going to win the game. And when I don't have that clear plan, I then just start like, but I'm not sure it's a term in chess, but like button clicking. Uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 I've played enough other games that, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean, uh, what you mean when you refer to to, to button clicking. And I, sure. then I, then I just blunder, you know. So I think my first like ten moves, I, I usually play okay, but then maybe I'll just do something like ridiculous, like I don't know, just something like G five, so just something silly, you know, and then I get captured or whatever because I just seem like I think at this point I usually make a kind of mistake, so. A good thing to prepare for would be when the board is quite like locked and symmetrical, mm -hmm. what to kind of have as a lot. Because like, let's just say you said pawn to me now. Like, yeah, I would, uh, I'd be like, oh, I'd be like, well, which one? You know? Like if, if we talk about this opening and this opening really isn't that unlikely. One thing uh, we should maybe be looking out for is that move knight g5 that we discussed earlier is not really a threat once we've castled. But the move bishop g5, the bishop for the dark square bishop to the same square, can be quite annoying uh, from white. Uh, like if you if you make it on the board right now, bishop c1 to g5. Uh, the, yeah, this the one dark, to yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, that that move is quite annoying because uh, it pins it pins our uh, our bishop our knight on f6. It pins it to the queen uh, and uh, makes our development kind of tricky. So you could actually once you have and and this will sound kind of hypocritical and uh, you you probably will get upset at me but i will mention that once we've sort of half finished development the move you mentioned way way back on move 3 does become very useful yeah playing h6 before they played this bishop g5 move is really not stupid at all because we don't really want to be dealing with this pin yeah that that's why that that was the reason why i moved it because i thought it blocks both of the advances yeah. the knight I get to take, but also it blocks the advancement of the bishop as well. So yeah, I thought it's like a it, it's it's a solid idea in general, but you do need to kind of make them not get too much in the center first. Because if we go okay. back, like just to, to illustrate why I'm saying what I'm saying, if we go back to if you go to the notation, there is a you know, bishop c4 h6 uh, two uh, two lines above. Yeah, if you just click on h6 there, you you'll get that position. H6. Okay. Yeah. So here white already can play. Uh, let's say d2 d4. D2, D4. Yeah, and uh, we have sort of lost the fight for the center already because we've made a move which doesn't really do very much. Mm -hmm. And they have assumed, re you know, a reasonable measure of control in, in yeah. the center. And it becomes awkward. Uh, so w what we're doing by postponing this move H6 uh, for a few moves and playing bishop C5 and knight F6 first is that we make it much harder for them to push d4 in particular. Bishop c5 uh, is played, it's a developing move, but if it has a like a clear-cut definitive target, uh, you know, why we're making that move bishop c5 instead of h6, mm -hmm. it is to stop them from achieving uh, achieving d4 and sort of winning, conclusively winning the fight in the center. Mm. Uh, but then we, we we do absolutely have to look at ideas of playing, of playing h6 to stop knight g5 and bishop g5. And if we go back to the position after uh is it here no, no no it's it's still in that same sub variation we were in d3 d6 where it says c3 d6 bishop g5 uh sorry i'm, I'm... one one line down yeah uh this one no uh, f, uh f, no uh in in the <coughs> in the gray areas uh one, one line up one line up from here uh 6 c3 d6 Ah, here? Yeah, okay. there. Let's say they don't play bishop g5, just to illustrate other play, other plans. Let's say they go h3 themselves, because they also perhaps don't like the idea of you pinning them. No, h4 is a bit too much. I think h3 is Sorry, I'm what in... we should be expecting. Yeah. So let's say we include h3 from them and h6 from us, which is also uh, something that happens okay. quite a bit here. So we've stopped knight g5, we've stopped bishop g5. Uh, so in terms of like looking for a plan of attack. And uh, I, I very much uh, sort of understand. And uh, mm, it's it's a very useful thing that you mentioned about uh, playing poorly when you don't have a clear cut plan. Can and, I tell you what my plan would be now? And then yeah. you tell me the flaws. So I sometimes start like chasing future positions too quickly. So like if I have a knight here, I'm sometimes like, okay, let's go one, two, three, and then get him there. So I, I would typically go uh, G5 and then try to get G, try to move to G4 to get into a position 
somewhere along here, like attacking the knight, something along those lines, because then if his pawn takes me, I can then take here, but then that's, that's kind a, of... That's a very aggressive line, which yeah. uh, you, like, if, if this is how you like to play, we could actually make an argument for not castling. It works a lot better if we haven't castled yet. Because I, because then if he takes me here, I get into trouble here, right? Yeah, it's, it's and also the rook, like, let's take a couple of moves back. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, back and back again and back, yeah, and back, without the castling. Let's say we play g6 here instead of castling. Uh, g6? d6. Ah, uh, d6, okay. d6. And let's say they play h3 here, which is really not that great, but let's say they do. Uh, in this position, I would actually argue that your plan that you just lined, uh, that you just lined up is quite quite interesting and also uh, very That's playable. You play, you play h6. Uh, I mean, this h6, will yeah. lose the pawn. So you play h6 first. And then you actually do play g5, g4, and try to open the the, the file. So what what would they do now? They do something like like this? Uh, no, that's too slow. Like the the general rule that people get taught at some point, like the, the there is a a pithy saying on on this topic, which is if you're being attacked on the flank, you're supposed to launch a counterattack in the center. So okay. Uh, a normal way of playing here would be to play c3 and then to play d4 on the next move. That would be one thing. Uh, another way to kind of diffuse our potential attack would be the move bishop e3 instead of c3. If we take this one back, they can play bishop c1 to e3 and try to trade some pieces. e3, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just just trying to, uh, you know, because the bishop on c5 could be quite, quite aggressive in these types of positions. So they so, just try to trade so some pieces. What I would do here is I, I don't want to move this pawn from this position, so yeah. I would move to b6 to, to back up the bishop. Is that bad? Or? That's a, not, I mean, me reasoning, reasoning is okay, but I think you don't need to. We, we, we can actually take that bishop ourselves. We don't really mind that much if we just take on e3 here and then okay. castle. We do have to, although, like, in terms of our attack on the queen, on the king side, that does make make the plan that we were talking about, the plan of playing g5 and g4, uh, a lot less potent because, uh, first of all, one of our potential active pieces has been traded off, mm -hmm. and secondly, because uh, that uh, that rook on f1 uh, is now a lot more active because this is what is called a semi semi open file, right? The f file is now not entirely closed down by pawns, so okay. the rook on f1 will be uh, will be in play. Uh, okay. But yeah, one thing, but. It's maybe useful for me to uh, uh, to understand these things because I can maybe try to uh, guide the game towards some positions where, uh, because I think you know we've had this discussion a little bit off air, but I think you know trying to sort of dull your instincts uh, to to you know try and play for you know slightly more plus EV lines. I think. It's it's not going to be very effective because you know if there's a if there's a certain way you play the game, trying to completely you know retool you and turn you into a completely different player by by day after tomorrow is probably not going to be you know wholly successful. Uh, so something something I think is important to speak about is. Uh, if if I blund if I make a huge blunder like let's just say I make like a huge punt, is it, it how how likely is it that it's game over or because usually you know I make a huge punt in a game I just like rage quit. Is there a way? Is there like um, I'm not sure how to phrase it. Is there a way where we can somehow salvage somehow like something after or are we are we uh, close it, to death? it very much depends on the nature of the blunder uh, and also I think we will we would have to like use. Uh, the first set to uh, adjust our expectations of, you know, we both kind of assume Ike will be good, but we don't know how good. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, the first set will be <clears throat> very useful trying to trying to understand exactly what level of a position we're talking about, about because, uh, you know, I mean, some, some blunders are absolutely game ending. <clears throat> if you okay. blunder a mate in one, the game just sort of ends. Okay. But if, let's say, you blunder a piece, I would resign that position against Alexander himself, right? But we're not playing against Alexander himself. We're playing against Dyke. Maybe he will return the favor at some point later in the uh, later in the game. So we're definitely not not resigning, at least in the first game, until mm -hmm. we have watched them, you know, convert a good position into a full point. 
Yeah. Or okay. or not convert, as the case may be, because you know people definitely return those favors in game, in particular when when there is multi gaming going on, which is. Uh, that is a big <clears throat> that is a big thing right that, that that's yeah. also why i mentioned it there's a higher chance that i blunder because we have like a yeah. poker game going on the side absolutely too, yeah. I'm, main, I'm probably so. i'm probably the only the only one of us four who has actually done multi-gaming uh yeah, of that sort before and that's probably why i'm not a winning poker player or at least yeah. one of the reasons <clears throat> because i you know having having things on the side when you play like six tables of mistakes is not probably the the wisest idea in the world for sure, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, in particular, in in, in that setting of uh, uh, of doing those things side by side, we, we we're not resigning. You know, if we if we just blunder a piece, we're not resigning yet. That's for sure. Oh we, no, I think I think we don't we don't ever resign. I think is the play in this. Yeah, I think I think we keep it we keep it going, uh, we keep it going, and uh, we we see we see how that. How that works for us? I think that's uh, okay. That's the general strat there. Um, so yeah, I think you know there is really not very much point in us, you know, trying to predict what the openings will look like. I think I got, uh, you know, I got a clearer idea of what you like and what you don't like uh, when it comes to sort of general play in the openings, which hopefully will be a little bit useful for me. I'm pretty sure I told you nothing that will be useful to you but uh no 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 uh, for sure you did for sure uh, you did. yeah i'm i'm just you know i've uh, i've been thrust into this uh you know somewhat fake coaching roles recently and uh, i sort of enjoy it but i still feel like i'm an imposter and uh <laughs> and, don't, and don't really have very much to contribute no as no a teacher. You, no it's <clears throat> you've you've given a lot you know i've never spoken in chess with anyone ever so like all of the stuff which i think or like don't don't know you know it's it's very very good to to hear you you know tell me that it's wrong or right etc so it, it, honestly it's it's very good for sure um, um okay and uh i think that probably seems like a logical point for us to to say uh that's probably the chess part the chess part covered for today and uh switch to uh switch to the other side where sure I so can, what i can properly show off my idc so what would you what would you recap as our learnings today from Chesson? I would say um, I think your fundamentals are solid, but uh, by your own admission, uh, you kind of you do things solidly for a while, and then you grow. I think just you know describing it as you grow bored is probably a bit unfair to you, but you do uh, you know it kind of wears off into into the unsolid territory quite quite quickly because um, I would say panic I, I panic that I'm not going to win the game you know every game I go into I'm like okay I have to win this game I have to win this game I need to get better at chess I need to get a better rating then I get into a mode where I feel like I'm not going to win and I panic I'm like oh god I need to do something that's how I feel like I have yeah I, I I sort of recognize recognize that feeling and uh, uh, yeah Perhaps you you know I, I I don't know how I can you know inspire you to panic less, but uh, I will I will repeat this, and I'm not just doing this because you know we are a feel good program, and uh, you, you know I'm trying to be nice. The fundamentals do seem solid, uh, but you know as long as as long as we can sort of keep keep this car on the road, <laughs> I don't think we're in too much trouble, and uh, I will have you know some some input into into where where the car goes obviously like it's a it's a bit touch and go when i can only name the piece but uh, i'm uh, the, the biggest takeaway from me is like I, I i think it was important for me to have some feeling for uh for what the positions you, you you normally get out of the openings look like because that will that will make it slightly easier for me to calibrate but also like the the the, the conversation about you know having plans and uh you know panicking when there is no clear clear plan available um it's uh i mean how shall i phrase it it's it's alarming on one hand because once again, we don't have very much time to, uh, you know, teach you how to establish plans and positions you've never seen before. And it's very likely that 
all three probably positions will get. If we if we get the three sets, you know, we we both feel we're huge underdogs. So getting to the third set already will be a <laughs> an achievement. But uh, if we if we if uh, you know my my horrible horribleness at poker okay. gets gets uh, somehow compensated by us absolutely acing the chess or the other way around, uh, we probably will get three positions we you you, you have never seen before. So yeah. Uh, on the one hand, you kind of panicking when you don't don't know what the plan is is worrying. But on the other, once again, this is an incredibly sound general feeling to have, because uh, playing without a plan is sort of the easiest way people get in trouble, and not even beginners. Uh, it's it's one of the things that that uh, gets drummed into you very. Early. I mean, maybe not very early on, but it's one of the absolute like cornerstones of. Uh, of what you get taught at some point that, you know, the, once again, the saying, which is as all sayings go, they, you know, it's probably not entirely correct, but they say, you know, playing, having a bad plan is much better than having no plan at all. Uh, and, and hearing you say those things already without me needing to tell you that mm -hmm. is, is sort of, you know, gratifying and, and, you know, f making me feel optimistic. That's good. That's good for sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess let's let's segue on to the poker then. Uh, yeah, sure. Right. So let's have a look. I'm going to give the guys a second to be able to pull this stuff up. Um, we'll let them do it. So for the people in the chat, do you guys have any experience of poker yourself or not? Because it would be... It, it, although we are obviously training with Peter, it's also it'd be nice for people to kind of understand or tell us a level which to which they understand, so we can maybe phrase <clears throat> it in certain ways. Because for the chess, of course, everyone watching probably uh, obviously going to be more advanced than I am and are going to un understand Peter's terminology. But I don't want to use terminology if uh, people don't understand it, etc. So let's just have a look at what the the chat says about the. Uh, I, I don't know which poker. chat you have opened. The, the, the chat I have opened uh, he doesn't seem to want to tell us much about their poker level. Chess 24. Uh, oh, you have, you have the, 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 the stream the, open, yeah. The, 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 the on-site stream open, because I, yeah. I'm i a I'm a Twitch person, so I have the Twitch chat open. Yeah, I, no, I have the Twitch open too, yeah. Yeah, uh, people are saying that there's actually some poker players here rather than chess, so that's, mm -hmm. also, that's also pretty good. Um, okay, sure. So... The format essentially is a heads up sit and go. A heads up sit and go is going to be uh, Peter and myself. We buy in uh, for the same amount of chips as as Ike uh, and Alex or Sasha, I guess. Uh, and it's a turbo format. So whereas chess might be a little bit slower and uh, poker is going to be a little bit more gambly, we're going to be there's going to be more there's going to be more luck coming into account rather than skill. Whereas chess is going to be very skill heavy uh in poker if you get in with the very best hand against the very worst hand the very worst hand still wins 20 percent of the time uh and in chess if i play the very worst strategy against the very best strategy i lose 100 percent of the time so the biggest difference and the biggest thing on our favor is that we can maybe get lucky even if we play poorly in the poker side uh which is which and by is we and by we we mean i personally but yeah <laughs> <clears throat> So there's a few things for poker, which we're going to look at. You have four streets in poker. So in chess, you kind of have the openings, the middle game, the end game. In poker, it's quite similar. In poker, you have the openings, which is which hands to raise, which hands to play, which hands not to play. Then you have the middle game, which is a free community cards, the flop. And then the end game is essentially the turn and the river. So we can, there is some similarities between poker and chess. So um, we have a spreadsheet here. Hopefully you guys can see this yet. So uh, so let me just pull this up. Uh, so essentially in poker, you have, um, you have all different kinds of flops, right? So for, for Peter, you've played PLO before, right? So you get four cards and now yeah, we're playing with... Now we're playing with two cards. So what, what yeah, are your so, what are your first kind of thoughts when you think, okay, what what's like unclear in your mind? No, I mean, I've 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 played I've played enough poker in my life to you know be 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 able to kind of bluff bluff the the jargon and uh, and and perhaps you know pretend pr pretend to talk to you on 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 a some so we, you know I, I I can I can definitely understand what you're saying. It's just that. 
my understanding of construction, uh, you know, range, range construction is, uh, I, I've played a ton of PLO in my life, but I've, you know, the, the, the studying I've done has never really been the, you know, the, the modern way of studying uh, mm -hmm. any of these games. Like I've never really worked with solvers. I've looked through hand histories plenty and I, I've listened to, you know, I've fallen asleep to Phil's voice more than probably any other voice in, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the world. So, uh, I, I've, I've definitely consumed a lot of training materials, but I've never done any kind of structured, structured work on, uh, on, you know, knowing the answers on, on certain textures. And, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding, you know, if you give me the, you know, the proper amount of cards, I probably on a good day might even not sound like a complete idiot, but, uh, in terms of playing uh, you know, heads up, no limit. Uh, my my idea of you know what goes where in, in the ranges will be mm -hmm. just so completely out of out of whack that uh, I mean I understand you're supposed to open pretty much like there is very very little we don't open in some way. Mm. Uh, so well, well, yeah, that's that that that's actually a good way to start speaking. So. In typically, people who are new to poker, they they very often see okay, you want to raise or you want to fold, right? Like when it's your opportunity, you're taught to okay, raise these hands, fold these hands. The problem is in heads up, if you want to play a, a lot of hands, your opponent has a very easy adjustment against you. It's like almost too an, too aggressive of an opening to only play raise and fold. So, for example. When we look here, this is 20 big blinds when we're mm -hmm. in the button. So we're the first person in with 20 big blinds. We can see here, um, we can see here that we only actually raise 25% of the time and we fold 0%. So actually the biggest node that we're going to be looking at here is going to be calling. So limping. So that yeah, we're, yeah. Not, we're not actually going to be raising or folding where most people we play against are going to be playing mostly raising or folding. And I think I imagine that Ike and Sasha will not play limps because approaching having a limping strategy is very, very advanced. So you can see here on the squares, you can see everything is a mixed frequency. So, mm -hmm. you know, seven, six suited is a 20% raise and an 80% limp. And it's going to be impossible for anyone with one hour's preparation to get all of these perfect frequencies in advance. So I imagine Sasha and Ike will not even consider limping and most likely will go for raise only. So what we can look at here is a uh, solver where essentially we can give Ike and Sasha a range of how we think they're going to play. So we can imagine that they're going to raise around about 70% of their hands or maybe a little bit more. Let's say they're going to raise about 80% of their hands and heads up. So let's just mm -hmm. say they play the top 80% of hands. Mm -hmm. I think this is quite a logical assumption. So this is 30 big blinds deep, they they have the option to raise, limp, or fold. It's very likely that Ike and Sasha are going to play raise only and not have a limping strategy because it's too complex. So let's imagine they raise 80% of hands. And then when we decide to go all in, I believe they will call, as in call our all in quite... That's uh, 20 bigs? 30 big blinds. Uh, 30 okay, big yeah. blinds, yeah. So we've gone mm -hmm. all in here for 29.9 big blinds because we've already paid 90. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine that they're, let's say Sasha's in, in control and we go all in for 30 big blinds. Sasha's probably yeah. only going to call all in with, with pretty good hands, yeah, I was, right? I was uh, so, going to tell you he's a nit, but you know that already. Yes, yeah, so I imagine he's going to call something like this for 20, for 30 big blinds because 30 big blinds are seen as quite a big shove, right? So mm -hmm. he's probably going to call something like ace eight offsuit a seven suited pocket fives and then like maybe some strong broadways like king jack suited so if this is the case what we can see here is i'll just uh basically this this uh tool we're using now is called holding resources calculator so you input the ranges and it tells mm -hmm. you how profitable each of your players are so against this you can see that if we have the very worst hand in poker free two offsuit it, we have a very clear all-in. So if our opponent doesn't play limps, we have a very clear all-in. Now let's imagine that instead of playing only raises from the button, they decide to play a very uh, they 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 decide to play a very heavy limp strategy, like they should be playing in terms of theory. Mm -hmm. Let's just give every hand. Uh, let's just give every hand here. 
uh, 25% frequency. So these hands previously were 100% frequency, which is what we expect them to play. Mm -hmm. But in, in reality, they should probably be limping 75% of the time with most combinations of hands and only raising 25%. Now, if they only raise 25% of the time here, uh, we can see how wide we should be shoving. Now, uh, yeah, they would call it wider here. So you can see, uh, let's just go down for here. So when this is the case and we shove over the, we shove over the ja, over the raise, we can see here that, uh, sorry, we can see here that versus raise, we can only shove uh, two through to eights, you know, like strong A6 hands. These are probably very intuitive jams. This is how I would imagine you would play normally. You would probably only shove the pairs, the A6, like the good hands for 30 big Yeah, that, right? that actually is something we, like, I, I think before we go into the construction of these ranges, I, like, once again, keeping in mind, I don't play the, 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 the godforsaken two card game at all, if I have a choice. Yeah. Uh, so, are we like at what point we aren't really looking to play post in the big blind? We're just not looking to play post at all, starting from like 30 bigs, or it has to go down lower. So, so we are very happy to we, like all of these hands in green are all hands which are happy to call off 30 big blinds. Uh, if you look here at 10 big blinds, for example, versus a raise, we would fold only 18% of the time. So, we're basically never. We're very rarely folding versus a raise because we get such good odds to call. But the main the main point is is that it's a lot easier for you to make decisions when you are the initial raiser with the initiative. So you're the guy who's telling the story. Let me let me let me rephrase. I I think I didn't really make myself you know uh, I didn't really make my point here. My point was. Uh, uh, like there's there's no actual three bet, is there? Like at, th at thirty bigs, I would ah. expect I would expect to have three bets. Why are we jamming thirty bigs there? So at thirty big blinds versus a raise, we actually do have a lot of a lot of raises. So you can see here at thirty big blinds, we are free betting with say hands like eights, nines, tens, jacks, the strong hands. But there's lots of hands which wants to just take its equity. So if you take a hand like pocket twos, right? Mm -hmm. If our opponent is raising so much. With pocket twos, we definitely want to go all in because first of all, if we re-raise, we get them to uh, to see a flop and pocket twos is going to play very poorly. There's always going to be free over cards, right? So there's lots of hands which definitely, there's like, a, in poker, there's always categories of hands, right? So you have categories of hands which want to for, to realize all of its equity. So a hand like ace nine offsuit against all of Sasha's and all of Ike's hands, ace nine is doing really well. We have really good equity against the hand. <clears throat> so, we want, so we want to realize all of that equity. But if we have a hand like pocket queens, uh, obviously we we don't mind if Sasha and uh, Ike come along with a hand, let's say like seven, eight suited because pocket queens is going to be dominating it. But with ace nine, you don't really want to give them the chance to see a flop with seven, eight. So it's always important to categorize hands as hands which want to realize all of their equity as soon as possible, or hands which want which don't mind to allow Sasha and Ike to improve some equity of their hand. Um, but typically, as the out position player, I'm suggesting that we just play very, very, very aggressively and do lots of shoving. So basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. making the game as much oriented around look as possible when we're out of position. And when we're in position, trying to make the game as orientated about skill as possible. All of that sounds fair. Yeah, this this sort of also raises the question of uh, you know exactly what the structure will be like. Like, what are we starting with? Are we starting with fifty? Are we starting with uh, like I I really really don't don't know what uh, what that will look like. I mean, it's uh, we will start it, with a hundred. We will start with a hundred. But we will, they told you actually. Yeah? But we will get down to this period of the game really quickly. Essentially, yeah, that, that will that, in, because it's a turbo. Yeah, yeah, uh, fair enough. Yeah, and. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it has been. It has been worked out. So that it takes like roughly the same amount of time as the chess game we will be playing. But uh, yeah, yeah. So so essentially, what we what we want to look out for Ike and Sasha is: are they limping or are they just raising? Mm -hmm. So basically, if we see the first three hands that we only see raises from mm -hmm. Ike and Sasha on the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh hand, whatever, we're just going to shove on them any two cards essentially. Like that would be the play because. Even first level? Uh, no, once we get to this, yeah, yeah. once we get yeah. to this forty big blind period. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is this is one of the most important things for us is 
to establish their game plan, right? Like in chess, mm. in chess, it's like, okay, are they going to play a gambit? Are you going to play this? There's so many different things they can do. In poker, there's two strategies. Either one, they're going to have limps, or two, they're not going to have limps. And if they are not going to have limps, which is what we can expect, we just have a very, very easy uh, readjustment against them just to play super aggressively and keep shoving on them until they start to limp. And I assume they're not going to study playing with limps. And if they don't study playing with limps, that's straight away going to throw Sasha out of his comfort zone because he's going to be thinking, well, what do we do? These guys just keep going all in on us. Like, do we start changing our strategy? Do we start limping? I assume that they're not going... I assume we're not going to be talking about the strategy. It's just going to be, you know, we're playing. Yeah, I think I think we will yeah. like the, the if it's done properly, there should be pretty much no talking. Otherwise, it kind of defeats the purpose. You know, if if it's if it's one person per street, it has to be one person taking the decisions and the other one just executing them. Otherwise, like you know, it, it's always going to be your decision. And I can, you know, we can definitely mitigate having an idiot on the team. <laughs> no, don't be silly. So. Yeah, as the out of position player in the big blind, our game plan is to just punish them as much as possible because the thing is, the best players in the world can't even play like this. Like, if you see all of these combinations, like, okay, is Ike really going to play 80% of 8 4 suited or 25% <laughs> of Jack 6 suited? Like, it's, it's impossible for any human mind to understand these frequencies or to implement these frequencies without following charts. So, so that raises questions for ourselves, right? How are we going to play this strategy? If if we expect that Ike can't mm -hmm. play it very likely, like no player in the world can play this, how are we going to play this strategy ourselves to make sure that we're not going to be punished by Ike and Sasha as well? If let's say they expect the same as we expect, you know? Mm -hmm. So from looking at this chart, what kind of, what would your instinctive takeaways be to try to make some kind of simplified strategy? Because in chess, it's very... There's so much different stuff you can do. In poker, our goal is always to take very complex strategies and to simplify them as easy as possible yeah, so that we can uh, remember this in-game, essentially. So this is how deep? This is 30, yeah? 30 big blinds deep. But even without seeing what, how deep we are, just by seeing the chart that I'm showing, red is red is raised and green is, is lit. Yeah, I, I can see the legend below, yeah. Uh, how, would you, how would you see this as a simplified uh, strategy here? Uh, basically flip a coin okay that's that's one way uh, uh with the you know with the exception of the you know the very strong hands and the very weak hands for uh, you know anything middling and middling appears to include some pretty strong strong hands as well or at least you know coordinated and suited hands which are uh -huh. obviously extremely attractive uh, -huh. uh, uh you just I don't know. Obviously, you know, you can use randomizers, whatever, you know, a chosen randomizer will be on the day, or you could just, uh, and probably using randomizers instead of like raising one hand and limping the next, so, because that actually gives them a much clearer, a much clearer and much earlier idea of what we're doing. If we mm -hmm. just, if we just sort of like preset it as, as, as one raise, one limp, one raise, one limp, they will probably recognize what's happening quite early on. So, uh, using some sort of a randomizer and uh, but splitting them looks like pretty much half half uh, is one mm -hmm. way I would go about things because like obviously there is no way I can process what goes where uh, in well slightly so the biggest difference between chess and poker is that in chess you make your strongest move always you know, there is a stronger move and you know when I'm trying to play a weak pawn opening on the flank you know, where I should be controlling the center of the board. That's just not good. But in poker, it's a little bit different. Sometimes you play your bad hands more aggressively than you play your good hands. So for example, here, you can see a hand like eight, two suited. This raises a hundred percent, but eight, six suited raises 20%. And for anyone with any for, uh, form of brain, it's very easy to assume that eight, six suited is a better hand than eight, two suited. So why are we playing eight, two instead of eight, six? So what what's just the... Uh, straight away intuitive thing in your mind for why we would play 8-2 and not 8-6 so aggressively. Uh, so that we can quite easily fall to the 3-bet, I think is... Yeah, exactly. If we open all 8-6, all 8-5, all 7-8, all 8-2, then what happens is the first thing I showed you in the calculator is that mm -hmm. I can Sasha can just go all in with any two cards. 
But the way that I the way that I assume Sasha and Ike will approach it is they will just raise eight six and raise eight two. And if they are doing that, then we have the very easy counter of going all in. So for ourselves, we want to have blocks of hands. So we want to say, okay, we want to raise these blocks of hands 100%. And everything else, like you said, we want to probably mix it 50-50. So trying to get caught up if something is a 30% raise or an 80% raise or 25% raise, there's no way we're ever going to be able to comprehend that. So being able to merge all of these together and having a 50-50 raise with all the medium hands, but mm -hmm. making sure that we do have a lot of full frequency raises too is important because if we raise a hand like 6-2 suited and we can make Sasha fold, let's say, jack six offsuit, that's a huge win, right? Because we mm -hmm. make him fold a dominated hand with a really bad hand ourselves. Uh, and also, if Sasha and Ike go all in and we fold 6-2 suited, that's fine. We, it's a really bad hand. Mm -hmm. But if we start folding, let's say, 8-6 suited, that's really big trouble because this hand plays really well post-flop. So essentially, what we're going to do is look at some different blocks here. So we're going to raise always with our strongest hands. So 10s, jacks, queens, mm -hmm. kings, aces, ace, queen, ace, jack, ace, 10 suited. So whenever you get really excited, that, oh, wow, we've been, been dealt a monster here. We're not going to try to get fancy or tricky. We're mm -hmm. just going to raise it. Also, whenever we have a really bad hand, which is suited, so whenever we have like a 7-2 or 6-2, we're just going to raise these as well. Uh, and then is there another block of hands that you can recognize here, which are played quite aggressively? Um, I mean, hang on a second. Let me let me make this larger. Uh, yeah, it seems like all of the all of the suited non-connectors, like the 9-4s and the and the seven deuces and uh Mm -hmm. All of those things are also well, pretty much 100 percent raise, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 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 those are, I guess, raised with the with the intention of uh, not not worrying that we have to fold them, and you know, yeah. So there's a there's another slight block of hands you'll see here as well. This is four big blinds just to show it's it's mm -hmm. quite similar. You can see here that the the queen six, the jack six, mm -hmm. the ten six, the ten seven. That's another block of hands we can also use as one hundred percent raises. So these hands are pretty good because when Ike and Sasha are going to go all in, they're often going to go all in with good cards, right? So like mm -hmm. ace queens, king queens, these kind of hands. So uh, maybe pocket sevens, pocket sixes. You know, for forty big blinds, we're probably going to see them fast play a hand like. Uh, it's pocket sevens, pocket sixes, whereas with pocket twos, maybe they just see a flop when we're a little bit deeper. So having a, a blocker, now a blocker in poker is where if we if they're going to be aggressive with, let's say, a hand like ace, queen, and pocket sevens, if we have a queen and a seven in our hand, they're less likely to have a pocket sevens and ace, queen. So they're less likely to be uh, aggressive back against us. So that's why we raise this block of hands. So the way that we can basically, I'm just going to pull up... Uh, uh, range here. So here is all of the hands we can be dealt in poker, right? So mm -hmm. I would I would basically suggest we do something along the lines of this. Uh, I'd say we do something along the lines of this, 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 uh, here, and then something like this. So this is how I would kind of make a very logical free categories of hands. So mm -hmm. we have our, our very bad suited hands, which are going to raise 100%. If, you, if, they re, if they raise all in, no problem. We're fine with that. If we have these hands as well, we are very happy to raise and fold. And if we have these hands, we're very happy to raise and fold, uh, to raise and, and get and, it and call And call it off, yeah. And call mm -hmm. it off. So why do you think we may want to raise a hand like Jack-5? What, 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 what's like, because I'm just trying to get like logic for you to be able to beat that hand, be okay, the logic is X. So why do you think Jack-5, apart from blockers, is a good hand to go for a raise? Uh, once again, I'm, you know, I can try to pretend to, to, you know, uh, yeah, uh, so what I mean, do you think is the difference between Jack eight and Jack five? Uh, I think uh, something I've heard mentioned, and I don't know if that applies here, is the idea that uh, uh, people uh, uh, people do uh, do raise uh, a small a lot, uh, or three bet, or perhaps shove if we're shallow enough. And this yeah. removes some of that range as well. Like Jack five, Jack five removes some of the Ace five suiteds. Okay. From their shoving range, but apart from that, uh, I I don't really like. I I would like to kind of plead the fifth and say I have no idea. Yeah, you're on slightly the wrong track. So basically, 
if we have a hand where we limp and we're happy to call a raise, we can limp. So if we have Jack-8 and we limp and Ike raises, we're happy to see a flop with Jack-8. It plays mm -hmm. a bit better. It's slightly higher cards. We're going to flop a straight draw more often. With Jack-5, if we limp and we get raised, we're really not happy calling, right? So if we're mm -hmm. not... If you, if you notice a lot of these hands, like let's say queen four suited, king five suited, queen seven suited, queen eight suited, if we limp and they raise, we're happy to call. If we limp, say seven two suited and we limp and they raise, we're not really happy calling no, their raise. Don't. So essentially, if we have a hand where we're like, if we have queen two and we limp and they raise, we're really happy folding. You know, we have a bad hand, no problem, we fold. But if we have like a hand like, you know, queen seven, jack seven, it's like, we don't really want to fold versus a raise, you know, but we don't want to really call a raise. So it's kind of in the middle. Whereas queen eight is very happy to call a raise mm -hmm. and queen two is very happy to fold to a raise. Same with seven two suited. Because we have a suited hand, if they raise, we kind of want to call, but we're not ec ecstatic about it. Mm -hmm. So if anything is kind of in that region where we don't, we're not happy to limp call and we're not happy to limp fold, these hands will typically go into a raise because they, they, they don't really... That does make sense. Yeah. They don't really enjoy the node of being isolated versus the big blind, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the logic comes into. So if you're delta hand, even if you don't remember the blocks, if you're delta hand and you're like, okay, am I happy to limp and face a raise? And if the answer is yes, you can limp. Because if you have eight too often, you face a raise, okay, you're happy, you fold. If you have, uh, you know, nine, eight offsuit, you face a raise, okay, I'm happy, I can call it, it plays okay. But these hands in the middle, the, you know, the seven free suited, you're not that happy calling a raise. You know, the four two suited, you're not that happy calling a raise. 10 six off, you're not that happy calling a raise. So if you're ever in that kind of territory, that's where your logic in game can be, okay, that's how I'm going to make the decision to, to, to play. So does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does make sense. Yeah. And if we play this strategy here, which we have, Ike and uh sasha won't really be able to exploit us because we have lots of good hands too so if they start re-raising us that's fine we have good hands that we can defend with uh so then we have all the other hands right because a hand like king nine is a pretty good hand we don't want to just play it so passively and just roll over to ike and sasha and be like okay we're just going to put the white flag up and let you punish us we want to actually make money with these hands because king nine against all of their hands is a massive favorite right yeah, so absolutely yeah. but at the same time if we raise them all the time they can just go all in with any two cards and we're just going to have to fold out King nine for 30 big blinds, which is really sad. So basically every other hand here just becomes essentially uh, a 50%, a 50% hand, right? So mm -hmm. all of these hands become in this kind of territory. So now we have basically uh, two different kinds of hand class. We have hands that are going to be a hundred percent raises and a hands that are going to be 50% raises. So um, this is essentially going to be our strategy. And now, at 30 big blinds and 40 big blinds, you can argue, okay, now we want to decrease to 40% or to 60% or whatever. We just don't need to worry about it, right? The, the difference between having a 40% raise and a 50, it doesn't matter at all. So if we have a good, a logical strategy and we can develop it across the, uh, the stack sizes, it's going to be a lot easier for you to implement. So essentially, this is going to be our preflop strategy mm -hmm. for all of the stack sizes between 25 and say, hundred big blinds, it's fine. You know, like this is just going to be how we're going to approach preflop, which is preflop is so important yeah. uh, in poker, obviously. So about this strategy here, do, is there any questions, any concerns? No, that, that, that does seem, that does seem very logical. Like, uh, no, I don't, honestly, I don't think I have, as an opening strategy that this works for me, this I think is something I can implement. The, I've, you know, I've never actually sort of practiced randomizing frequencies, but I'm sure, you know, this can be, this can yeah. be worked out. So typically when you randomize, a lot of people will have a different randomized, like, okay, 20, like you'll often see people saying I roll high or I roll low. Yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. like common theory in poker. And it's like, that's because you have a lot of like 20% raises or 10% raises, but because we are simplifying just simply a 50% mm -hmm. randomization, you get, it's lit, like you said, flipping a coin, it's literally that easy. It's like, okay, what's the time? Is it even? Is it odd? You know, like, yeah. what's my what battery level? Is it, is my battery level 81 or 82? Or for me, like 12 or 13, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's that, it's that kind of logic. So this should be just so simple for it to, to work out. Yeah, I don't, that, that works for me. Yeah, for sure. As in like open and strategy in terms of chess, like it should be almost impossible to get this wrong. I think, you know, like I, I think you would play this as well as I can play it. I don't really see how I could play it any better. Do you know what I mean? Because we're going to play the same strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so 
as the opener, that's going to be our strategy. So this is preflop against them. Our 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 assumed strategy is that we're going to just shove a lot when they open because mm -hmm. we feel like they are not going to play limps. If for whatever reason they start to play limps against us, it's good to look into that just in case because. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at 30 big blinds, if they limp, we can see how we play. And again, it's quite a similar strategy, right? So you can see where the red and where the green is. So the red is essentially coming from the same category. So you can see it's coming from the very weak suited hands. It's coming from our really, really good hands. And then it's coming from some of our, you know, 10 sevens, jack sevens again. Uh, whereas if you look at a hand like king six, it's never raising. Queen eight, it's mm -hmm. uh, king six suited, never raising. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're happy. We're happy to realize equity with uh, with with decent hands. But I, as I can see from this graph, we we're only really shoving, like we're shoving, somewhat less than premium aces and suited garbage, pretty much, and small pairs. Yeah, I mean we're risking a lot, right? Like we're risking mm -hmm. thirty big blinds to win two big blinds. You know, like mm -hmm. the 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 risk reward for our play is very bad. Like if we if we have let's say even like ace four offsuit, it feels like oh ace four is a really good hand here. But if we risk thirty big blinds to win two, like it's not really worth it because remember when we get called when they limp, we shove thirty big blinds and they've set the trap with one of their yeah. strong hands. Our ace four is in very bad shape yeah, now. It's, you know? so it's not, not doing well. Yeah, risk reward is not good. And also another important thing here, like well, not super important, like. On a, on a higher level, it's important is that imagine we just shove all of our ASEX hands always and we raise all of our ASEX because they're really good hands. Then what's going to happen post flop? If an ace comes out, I can Sasha can just go bananas against us because, well, we have no ASEX hands, right? Because mm -hmm. we've shoved all of them pre flop. So in poker, you always want to have some kind of coverage on every board texture. So mm -hmm. this is. But at the same time, we always want to get the max value out of our ace king. We always want to get the max value out of our ace queen. So we're never really going to, if we are going to want to have some frequency of an ace, we're always going to choose our worst ace x hands because these are the ones which have the least EV from, from being in our raisin range and making the pot bigger, uh, essentially. Um, so when they limp, we're going to have a similar approach to our button strategy. We're going to raise our very good hands. We're going to raise them with very trashy hands, but the middle of our range is going to play very passive and just play very checky against them. So that's kind of approaching versus limps. Uh, but yeah, this is basically preflop. Um, because it's a turbo format, it's very likely we're going to get down to like seven, eight big blinds. Um, and this is where a lot more shoving comes in. So Yeah, I have actually played some some push fold. Uh, okay, cool. That's good. But I've, I was better at it and it was a long time ago. So that's not a particularly good combination. So, so one of the biggest mistakes people make is calling too tight versus, versus shoves. So if we go, this is eight big blinds. So for eight big blinds, our opponent shoves all in. You can see how wide we're supposed to call for eight big blinds. So I had like queen two, I had like nine, seven, I had like jack six, I had like queen six offsuit, I had like 10 nine offsuit. You can see here, we have to gamble very wide against their shoves mm -hmm. because we just have good equity against them. And if we start folding too much, we just make their shoves so profitable. Like they're, they're shoving hands like 10 free suited, six free suited, queen five offsuit, queen two offsuit, eight, six offsuit, you know? So because they're shoving so wide, uh we have to gamble wide but i imagine that sasha will probably call too tight versus our shoves so if he is controlling preflop what i think the adjustment is is to go bananas and really shove a lot against uh, him yeah once again without like how how safe are you in that assumption well it's very unintuitive right so what i'm in in head no, but like knowing what we sort of know about about Sasha as a player, I think that is not a particularly safe assumption because he will actually know the answer there. Well, it's it's quite a, even even in high stakes, uh, people who play for millions of dollars, they will usually get this wrong because it's so unintuitive. Because calling all in with say ten nine offsuit, it feels like oh I have ten nine offsuit, it's not a very good hand, right? Or queen six offsuit. Even at the very, very highest level, like when Ike Haxton plays a 100K tournament two days ago, the people in the tournament who are literally putting hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line are usually making these autopilot mistakes. And remember, we're playing a chess match and a poker match. So mm -hmm. you, you see an all in and say, like, oh, I've got 10-9, okay, obviously fold. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, it's a, well, let's put it this way. 
it's a lot easier for him to make too tight mistakes than yeah, too loose. Yeah, too absolutely. Loose, it's just that I, I wanted to, uh, you, you know, once again, I'm, uh, you know, apart apart from being a friend of his of very long standing, I'm also a bit of a, you know, I, I, I kind of rate him as a player in, oh, in every course, single yeah. game very highly. And I kind of know... I know his background, and uh, you also sort of know his background there, course, without going yeah. into detail. Yeah. Uh, if he is not too distracted by what's happening on the chessboard, he, you know, he, he, you might expect reasonably constructed ranges there. Uh, well, the thing is also that I imagine they are mostly going to prepare for like deeper stack play. So, like looking into like eight big blind push fold is going to be quite a complex thing to look into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I imagine they're going to look more into raising ranges, playing free bet ranges, like that kind of stuff, rather mm -hmm. than the shove fold for like five, six, seven, eight big blinds. I imagine they're going to be, you know, the the sexiest way to learn poker is to play the big pots post-flop and to bluff and to make yeah, river yeah. bluffs. Like that's the most interesting kind of, that's the end game theory, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is like, this is like the boring stuff nobody wants to do. Like looking at the difference between 0 0.37 and 0 0.34 or looking at all these like small things, which don't really matter too much. But once you add up all the small things, it ends up mattering quite a bit. Uh, like I said, even at the very, very highest level of poker for people who play this game, all day every day and study this game all day every day the mistakes that they make are not in the sexy parts of the game tree because it's a lot easier for them to study it's more from the more boring kind of yeah the, of the, the kind of a routine drudgery that yeah. you, you don't particularly want to do yeah i understand that and, you know, and that, myself that, that. and myself i i would be making these mistakes you know like knowing knowing to call off you know like nine big blinds with say 10 nine offsuit or queen four suited like I will for sure get these wrong because it's almost impossible to get it right. And almost everyone goes into being too tight rather than yeah. too loose. And yeah, the, the adjustment definitely is people go to we're way too tight in that spot rather than the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we're going to see quite quickly. So if they start playing a limping strategy against us, mm -hmm. then, we, then we will see that they're very well prepared. I just don't expect it to happen. I just expect them to to play very aggressive uh, with their opens. And it's just a simple way to play. It's the way that people mostly play. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also probably going to expect us to play too tight. So it's probably correct for them to play lots of raises, right? Because they're not going to expect us to start just like doing lots of shoving for loads of big blinds all the time. They probably expect us to play. If they're trying to exploit us in any way, they're going to imagine that we are playing too tight. So if they're looking at the same information, mm -hmm. they're going to probably say, oh, Peter and Pads are going to call too tight for nine big blinds, 11 big blinds, et cetera. So their assumptions are probably going to be in a similar direction to what our assumptions are going to be, I imagine. Yeah, very likely. Yeah, um, that, that sounds logical. Let's just go quickly into post-flop because sure, obviously yeah. pre-flop is the most important because we're not going to see many flops when it's 20 big blinds deep eight big blinds deep there's going to be so much shoving we're not going to see mm -hmm. too many flops but it's slightly deeper stack sizes we're going to see some flops so this is 40 big blinds deep so um in poker there's different kind of board textures so you can see the different kind of board textures you can have you can either have a paired board mm -hmm. you can have a monotone board you can have a disconnected board like a a nine five two mm -hmm. you can have a connected board like a seven eight six kind of board you can have an a side board obviously you can have a broadway kind of board um, let's just look at one type uh, mm -hmm. where you where maybe you have some kind of doubts. Just just name a name, name a board texture and we can look into it. Uh, out of this, uh, let's go with uh, high disconnected. High disconnected. Okay. So high disconnected boards are going. This is a very common board texture as well. So. Uh, this is going to be a board like queen seven six, jack five four. So the high card isn't connected to the middle part of the board. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, let's see. First of all, is there going to be any all in? So all in would be we would be betting like six uh, x the pot. So let's just have a look. First of all, does this ever happen? Uh, no, it never happens. So straight away, we can just remove this from the game tree. So I can just press hide. Perfect. Is there going to be any really, really, really big betting? So betting 2x the pot, is this ever going to happen? Let's have a look. Very like, very likely not. You can see here, no, it never happens. So we can hide this. So straight away, we've taken away a bunch of the potential game tree, which is nice. Okay, is there going to be any pot size betting? Any huge betting going on on the flop? We can see not really. So straight away, this These is... These are percentages or... This is how often it happens. So if you take, for example, queen seven, six, mm -hmm. we can see we bet 50% of the time. We check 50% of the time. Uh, we bet 
small 12% of the time, we bet biggish 25%, and we bet pot 100% mm -hmm. of the time. But you can see that there's basically no boards here which are betting pot size. Like there's a few which happen 10% of the time, but most of them are happening basically zero. So but basically what I'm trying to explain here is that we are basically going to never bet really big. I've basically mm -hmm. taken out that part of the game tree. So all we're going to be doing is either betting small or betting 30% of the pot or betting 60% of the pot, essentially. So uh, let's have a look. Is there any boards where we bet very often for the small size? And you can see there are. So now let's like, let's try to find some similarities between the boards where we bet for a small size. Because you can see all of these boards are never betting big and they're only betting small. Does that make sense? Like this column, mm -hmm. he, this, yeah. col this column here, there will be some boards where it's betting big and not betting small. But when we filter only for small bets, we can see that this this uh, big bet is never happening. We're only betting small. So kind of the board textures we're looking at are going to be king eight free, king eight free, king free two, king free two. Yeah, I was going to say most of them are uh, uh, rainbow, but they aren't. Uh, no. Yeah, a lot of them actually are uh, showing a flash draw there. So. so why do you think on, why do you think it's very dominated around king X? as being the high card. Why do you think King X is a very dominating strategy here? Yeah, we're getting to the the, the hard part of the quiz. Uh, I, can pull, I can pull up, I can pull on it. So it's just gonna load up one second. Sure. Uh, yeah, so on King, so let's take a board of Jack-8 free or Queen-8 free or those kind of board textures. There's, oh, let me just pull this out. There is some stuff going on. So this is basically Alex, uh, Ike and Sasha checking in the big blind. And then this is our strategy. As you can see, uh, we're only using this smallest sizing, which is going to be mm -hmm. uh, the 30% the sizing. So this King-8 free, Kind of an interesting board texture, right? Because let's say the board is Jack five two. If our opponent has himself a king high, it's very likely he's going to call more often uh, mm -hmm. if we bet small. So we can start using a bigger bet to put maybe a bit more pressure on some hands. Whereas on a king high board, it's very likely they, they don't have as many overcards because they're going to be aggressive with their ace hands pre flop a lot. So essentially, when we bet small, we just make them fold their jack seven, their jack six, their jack. We don't need to bet big to make a lot of hands fold. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that does make sense. Yeah, that was uh, not exactly what I was going to say, but I think uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I I I I I definitely can see how how that is the case. Yeah. So if it's a board text, I was I was going to say sort of more specifically that they don't have very many kings in their flatting range. But I don't know if that's actually true. That probably no, they, isn't very true. They have a lot. You can see they have all these kings. They have all of these kings. They have a lot of kings. They would probably even flat potentially all of their kings. They would just be, see, you know, if we raise and they have king four, they'd be like, okay, king four, probably the best hand. Don't want to be too aggressive with it. Can't fold it. Like, okay, I'm going to see a flop, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so probably they have a lot of kings in their range. So basically the logic, you're never going to get this perfect because there's uh, 1,775 boards, you know, there's, there's a lot of board textures going on here. Uh, if we, if we pull all the boards back in, we can see here that this is how people, for, for the chess people who are watching, this is how poker players kind of study. You know, you have 1,700 boards and you try to find patterns <laughs> between them and you try to find when to bet big or when to bet small. But the whole goal of poker is always to simplify because you played, in chess, you play one match usually. In poker, I played 20 tables. So I can't remember, okay, 61% here, 32% here, 110% here. You, you need to find some uh, patterns and try to use these patterns to have logical decisions. So essentially, if we can put pressure on all of their hands with a small bet, we'll bet small. So on a king high board, if, if the board is king eight free, if we bet small, their jack high hands are in pressure, their queen high hands are in pressure, their seven eights are in pressure, stuff like this. So that their six seven, sorry, anything yeah. which is not anything which is not paired is in pressure. But if you take a board of let's say jack five six which is a bit more connected mm -hmm. uh if we bet small they're not really in that much pressure of many hands if they have an ace high hand they will call if they have a king high hand they have an overcard so if they improve they have a really strong hand so their king high hands can call versus a small bet if they have maybe a straight draw they're not in any pressure versus a small bet mm -hmm. if they if they have bottom pair they're not in any pressure with a small bet but if we start betting really big on jack five four 
Now, if they have a hand, let's say queen nine, which has like a little bit of a backdoor straight or yeah. a backdoor flush on, we start to put pressure on this hand. Let's say they have a hand like king 10 offsuit. We can put pressure on them by using a bigger size. And so the only logic I want you to think about in the match is, uh, do I need to bet small to put pressure on or bet big to put pressure on? Understanding the exact size and inferior and frequencies and starting to randomize, it's impossible. Like when yeah. it, it's going to take five, 10 years of study. All your only logic and thought process is going to be how do I put pressure on? Do I bet big to put pressure on or do I bet small to put pressure on? That's the only thing you need to think about uh, from a simplistic point of view. Is there any any like questions which come up straight away from that? No, I think I would need to, uh, sort of, uh, once this is over, I would need to uh, take a look at this again and uh, try to, because it's like trying to, uh, trying to, you know, imbue this uh, uh, while also talking and, uh, uh, you, you know, ho hoping to, to, to participate in the, in the conversation a little bit is, is, harder but i think i think all of this does make sense obviously you know we're we're not touching you know large parts of large parts of the game tree but we do have like we've pretty much run out of time already and i understand mm -hmm. that uh you know there are there are these constraints but what we've talked about so far does make does make a decent amount of sense to me and i don't know i don't know how well i will be doing that in game probably not very well but uh, it, it, it definitely makes makes enough sense to for, for me to have some hope of perhaps not not botching those decisions too badly. Well, the best thing about this is that in poker, if you use the small sizing instead of the big sizing, you don't usually give away much. Like you're not losing that much uh, as in terms of EV. Whereas in chess, if you make the wrong move, you blunder. It's massive. It's massive consequences. Yeah, in I, I in poker, that. if you bet big instead of small or small instead of big doesn't really matter too much. The EV difference you'll lose won't be too much. There won't be too much difference. It's a theoretical way to approach this, the game. But in general, if you just decided, okay, I'm always just going to bet small, no matter what on the flop, we, we would not lose too much difference. Yeah, it, sure. So this is what I was going to move on to, that if it's never a board where you think, okay, I want to bet really big, just always fall back into the safety blanket of just betting small. If you bet small, it will with any hand, uh, in any spot. Just it will just never one be a bad just thing. one question before before we continue with this. Like, what's the what's the checkback percentage in general? Like, are we playing like a ninety percent C bet frequency or? Cool. So yeah, we can we can look into this. Uh, we can look into this. One second. Actually, it won't show us here. Uh, in in general, we're going to be C betting around about seventy five percent of the time, and checking around about twenty five percent. So typically, the reason why you would check would be a board texture. Like, let's say the board is Ace King Five. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say the board is Ace King Five. What is a hand which you may not want to bet on Ace King Five? What's a natural hand to check on Ace King Five? Um, I'm guessing. I don't know. Like I would say, I probably want to check all of the gutters. Uh, I Ace King Five Rainbow, Ace King Five, Just Ace King Five, Ace King Five, whatever. Yeah, like it doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, Ace King. So basically, like the way I would think about it, and it's probably completely incorrect, is uh, I, I don't want to get blown off, like you know, we're probably not checking hands which can be reasonably bad for value. So we're not checking, we're not checking back aces. We're probably not checking back kings as well. Although, I mean, that's already something I'm not entirely sure, but I suspect in a heads up, in a heads up game, we, we aren't really checking back very many second pairs. Uh, I'm, I'm checking back things which have good turns, but mm -hmm. which will have to fall to a raise. Okay. The thing is, the thing is, I don't know how to construct that range. So, like, I don't know. Like, maybe in particular, if this is like a Broadway type board, maybe I'm supposed to to, to bet call a, a bet call a gutter. But well, this 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 is already like a, a slight flaw in the logic. The thing is, like, it's in in chess. I guess it's a similar way. Where, okay, if I do X, my opponent will do Y to counter us. In poker, there's lots of ways where our opponent is. Is he can't do why because on let's always go back to preflop right preflop he's very aggressive with his ace x hand so he needs to tell a consistent story so let's say we bet on ace king six it's very likely that he never raises us because what's he representing if he has like ace ace 10 he's going to re-raise his preflop ace jack re-raise preflop pocket kings re-raise preflop so if he has like a hand like 
ace four offsuit he's not going to raise on the flop he's going to generally play quite passive right mm -hmm. so on this kind of board texture he's not really incentivized to raise anything for value or as a bluff because we are the one who has the advantage he's playing more defensive you know like mm -hmm. we're the white piece he's the black piece in this kind of situation you know we are chasing him around the board rather than him chasing yeah, us around the board yeah. so in this kind of situation the logic about oh i don't want to bet for the gutter it's more about what am i getting out of betting my hand because let's say we have a hand like pocket queens here pocket queens is there much point of betting pocket queens when we bet pocket queens the only it's, hand, the, it's the way ahead way behind thing right exactly it's, he's always yeah. going to call a king he's always going to call an ace he's not going to call like seven eight offsuit so there's no real point of betting so in general there's you may get some hands which want to check in spots where there's just not much incentive or point or getting anything out of it so for example uh, you may check like an underpair on high boards because they're always going to call with better hands, always going to fold with worse hands. Even a king, like if you if you have say king two on ace king six, there's not too much reason to bet your king because they're always going to call an ace, they're mm -hmm. always going to call a king, and they're always going to fold when they have nothing. So even a king can check in these kind of situations. So to answer your question, how much betting is there? How much checking is there? Typically, we want to bet very, very often because we are the one who has the strongest hands. We're the one who has the strongest range. We're the one who's representing that we have the strong hands and we're going to push that story to the river with our good hands and our bad hands, our good hands support and our bad hands. Um, but if a board texture comes very favorable for our opponent, maybe like a, a five, six, seven kind of board where they have a lot of this, you know, eight, nine, where mm -hmm. we are maybe limping these hands and our aces don't really love five, six, seven, because we're dead against them when they have a straight, that might be a board texture where we want to play a bit more passive. No, I, I mean, on, on, a, on a low connected board, I understand we're not, we're not betting, we're not betting our broad base. This, this, this part I would, I would get the, the specifically like on an ace king, ace king five, I was, yeah. Uh, I was sort of more confused, more confused than usual. <laughs> let's let's put it like this. Perfect. But I, I would really recommend that as a default, always we just start. Okay, I'm going to bet this flop for a small size, and that's just mm -hmm. going to be our default. Yeah. If if you ever then have a good logical reason to either check or to bet big, go for it. You know, because if you have that logical reason to bet big, by the time I get to the turn. I'm going to be in flow with your logical reason. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah, if, yeah. You've, if you've bet really big on a board, I'm going to understand your reason for doing it. Or if you check, I'm also going to understand your reason. And so our default is always going to be, we're going to start with a small bet. And then if you decide to deviate from that, no problem. I'm going to be able to fall in, into that on the turn. That's yeah. I mean, fun. that's, that's, I mean, having the safety net of you playing the turn obviously is, is very, very beneficial, but uh, yeah. This is already extremely helpful because, um, as you said, and this is also something that uh, I wanted to draw some some parallels with with, with chess in as much as it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, what you said about uh, not just working with solvers, but uh, trying to sort of understand why the solver is telling you what it's telling you, so that you can implement it in game when you are in a situation where there's like no way no way you can actually remember what it says uh, mm -hmm. precisely and you know you you are you know multi mass multi tabling and don't mm -hmm. really have uh, time to go for like pre precise recollection anyway this is this is something that i feel you know very much familiar with because uh, a lot of a lot of our work is these days a work with uh, with engines Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, as 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 close to a solver as it can be, as it can. It, it's very much once again uh, machines telling you what the right line is. Uh, in in chess, probably, you, you know, it's it's even more pronounced because it very often will not even give you percentages. It will give you a definitive answer uh, mm -hmm. that does not need to be, you know, randomized or or mitigated or balanced in any way because there is a very often a single answer. But the thing is when uh, uh, very often the output that uh, the, the machine gives you uh, while you, you sort of it's it's one of those like the the old Soviet joke was uh, that you know in the what's that called uh, what's that game called in uh, spin the wheel I think it's called like when uh, not not exactly spin what's the what's the game where they guess guess letters uh, uh price of fort bruce's for fortune something fortune yeah pro yeah it's the will of fortune exactly will yeah. of fortune yeah so, <laughs> so basically the, the old joke goes you know uh guessed guessed all the letters correctly couldn't read the word 
Yeah. And, and that's and that's very often how you feel about this computer output. Mm -hmm. It tells you things in a language you understand because you've been working professionally on chess for for a very long time. So like it gives you a long line and says you're winning at the end of this line. And you understand every single like you can see every single decision separately. But yeah. they don't make sense to you as a whole. You don't really understand why these decisions are being taken in the process. And then if in game you can't remember precisely what it said mm -hmm. and you and you 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 put in no work trying mm -hmm. to internalize why it was taken while you were while you were clicking, it just all falls apart. And and like you 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 this is what often happens these days because there's so, so such informational overload that uh, trying to memorize everything will often fail, and you do have to uh, <clears throat> you do have to go through that work again and again and again, uh, trying to explain it to yourself in human words. And and like this fifty minute conversation has already done a lot for me in terms of like uh, I can look at these charts on my own until the cows come home, and they will not really be telling me anything at all. Yeah. But when you explain to me why things belong why things belong in certain ranges this this does make me you know at least hopeful that i can i can process this information and maybe even use it uh use it in games so that that has Perfect. been that has been very very helpful that i know i know we're going to finish in two minutes i just want i just want to end on uh you're going to play the river by the time we get to the river the pot's going to be really big so it's the most important street i guess it's similar to like uh End game theory and chess, mm -hmm. you need to be able to play. So just one thing about the river is we're only going to bet big on the river or check. We're never going to bet small on the river, which might be something which is like not a familiar concept. But the way that we're going to approach it together is that we're only going to bet big on the river. So just for example, let's say the pot size is uh, eight on the river and we have, mm -hmm. say, a stack size of 30. If you decided to bet on the river, uh, say 30%, like a small size and like we mm -hmm. did on the flop, right? You would bet something like 2 point, like two point, let's say you bet 2.5. Um, if you bet 2.5 on the river uh, and you want your opponent to call you, we're not always right, right? Like if, we, mm -hmm. if we're betting small, if we're betting small, it means we don't have like a massive hand. It's like a marginal kind of hand where we track, we, we probably have the best hand like 60% of the time, let's say. So if we, have, if we have the best hand 60% of the time when we get called, we are winning 10% of our bet, right? We win 10%. So we're winning, we're winning uh, 0 0.25 mm -hmm. uh, and the pot size is eight. So trying to win an amount of 0 0.25 when the pot size is eight, usually it's always going to be better to check because there's the option of our opponent to bluff us. Mm -hmm. So if our opponent just decides to bluff us 10% of the time and reopen the action, if he goes all in all this time, we we straight away lose that 0.25 because we have sometimes fold in the best hand. Okay, mm -hmm. so very important for us on the river that we don't want to be betting small. Once we get to the river, if we decide we want to bet, we're typically going to only bet 50% bigger or check. In general, like master theory, we would have some smaller bets, but for simplification, we're only going to bet the river if it's kind of worth to bet the river. Let's say you know if it's mm -hmm. worth because if we're only trying to make you know like one percent of the pot. It's not really. There's not really much point of betting the river that way. You know? So what's so, the like? What's the size? Of, I, I I see all the all, all, you know. Are, are over bets on the river still a thing? Uh, we're not going to really go into that uh, because it's too complex. <laughs> yeah. We're only going to do two sizes. We're going to have fifty percent, and we're going to have a hundred percent. So if we have a, a spot where we're very polarized, where we either have really really good hands and really bad hands, we're going to bet a hundred percent. Or if we have some like finished bets where maybe we have like a second pair or maybe mm -hmm. a third pair, we're going to put them more into the 50% size. And now this is not, you know, G game theory optimal. There will yeah, be some I, small I sizes, et cetera. Yeah. But for the best way for us to approach it in game to make sure that, you know, Ike doesn't start like getting some crazy check raises in and then we wish we didn't reopen the action with our fourth pair or whatever, we're going to bet a little bit tighter. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to bet and larger, yeah, and, tight, and tight, tighter and larger, yeah, tighter and larger. And we can still have some finished bets, but we're just not going to be betting, let's say, fifth pair on the river for twenty percent. We're going <laughs> to, yeah, we're going to get more into the route because also we're playing a chess game as well. So we don't want to get into a really complex part of the game tree where you bet twenty percent on the river. Uh, Sasha raises and now it's back on to me and now I need to work out how we're going to do this whilst I'm also doing an end game in chess yeah, at the same yeah. time. It's, uh, yeah, it's probably probably not uh, the greatest. And, and and bluffs generally go into the pot sized portion. Uh, I no, see. I mean it depends if it depends if our bluffs are always proportionate to our value. Yeah. So if we are 
if we are betting lots I of realized hands. I realized what I said was idiotic just as I was saying it. Yeah, if we're betting if, if we're betting lots of hands for value, then our value will typically maybe go into the 50% size and, and our bluffs will support our value because it's very easy for Alex and Sasha that if we put all of our bluffs into one category, they yeah, yeah, be able to. I, I, just as I just as I finished that sentence, I thought, yeah, that's the stupidest thing I said today. And uh... no, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, this is how a lot of people play, actually. They only bluff for one size and they bet value for the other size. And so yeah. it's actually it's like a a, a meme in poker too. But yeah, I think I think we have a quite simplistic approach, but a simplified approach, which I think is important. You know, pre flop we've yeah, got definitely yeah. pre flop. I think we have a logical, simplified approach, which should be quite easy for us to implement. Flop, we're going to go with the small bet always, unless you have a a reason that you really want to bet big or you want to check, which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, turns, I should I should hopefully have under control. Then on the river, we're not going to have like four different bet sizes. We're only going to bet big, or we're going to bet you know medium size. So. I think from poker, we, I think we, I think we're, I think we're going to do okay. You know, like I don't. Yeah, mind. We'll, we'll see. I mean, probably, probably not. But for, I, I feel, I feel more confident than I, than I had, I had uh, felt before before this call. So that's that's already an improvement because. Yeah, and we're we're obviously going to finish now. If you have any questions offline, obviously you're going to write to me and. Uh, yeah, I've, I I probably might might bug you a little bit. No, of course. Uh, once once this is over, yeah. So for the for the people watching now, uh, do we know the time on Friday? I think it's seven p.m. two on Friday. Uh, UK. It time? probably is the same time as this uh, as this thing was. Uh, yeah, well, it's just been confirmed in chat here. It's going to be it's going to be seven p.m. UK, ten for me. Perfect. Uh, and we'll go for as long as it goes. I have no idea. If there's a betting market on the match, uh, you know, unless yeah. unless they give unless they give us twenty to one, don't don't put your money on. Uh, where <laughs> yeah, I, I very much endorse endorse people not not backing backing yeah. this particular team, but, but, but we will, we will try our best, and we will, uh, we, we will might, try. We best. might surprise some people. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and if we win, we we have to get a title and we take on two new people, you know. So hopefully, yeah, ho that's, hopefully, that's a, yeah. King maybe there's the a hill. belt. Yeah, there's a belt. King, King yeah, hill, like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, gonna end it this, now. This, yeah, this is this has been very enjoyable. Thanks very much, Patrick, for for doing you this. You too. You too. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for people in the chats, and uh, we'll end it now. And yeah, GG. Do you say GG in chess? Is that is that a term too? It's becoming becoming part of. Yeah, I mean, chess has moved online very much in, the, in in 2020 because of you know for obvious reasons and uh, all of the 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 online mannerisms are nice uh, kind of seeping in all right well G ggs to the chess guys yeah, uh, we can we can we can end the broadcast on having a very you know lively one minute discussion on what you do with the people who say gg after winning or we, <laughs> or we might not yeah like probably probably shouldn't but it's a it's a like a very fun topic to discuss for like a, a little bit but probably not right now maybe on a pod maybe on a podcast sometime. yeah some some sure. at some point at some point in the future Perfect. Uh, all right thanks uh thanks everyone for for watching thanks patrick and uh yeah well uh, watch watch the thing on whatever it is friday yeah okay be fun gg bye bye